Yes. Because many of you, you are into chiropractic, and I want you to pay real attention to this. You're into chiropractic, but there's very, very few of you that have chiropractic into you. Now, there's a critical and a significant and a profound difference. You're just into chiropractic. But the approach that the big men and women, the successful men and women, have always been in DE, in chiropractic, or in any field of endeavor, whatever their chosen occupation, their field, it drives them instead of them driving and manipulating whatever it is they might be. That means that you eat, sleep, breathe, think, talk, act, behave, and ultimately serve chiropractic. It, it's supposed to consume you. Now, it's not, there's a, there's a lot to that. I mean, a lot to it, and I'm not intending to give you an explanation of that particular concept, but you need to learn how to get in the center. Then you'd be ultimately and intimately interested in a person like Dr. Sarah Soli, a person like myself, a person like Dr. Braille, who was a lot of people were discourteous to Dr. Braille last week, Dr. Sarah Soli too. I'm not saying it's you. I'm just saying the general mood, the general idea that you don't need anything, you don't need any help, you just need to get your degree. That's not the way it is. It's just a relatively few of you, and I, don't, I want to be blunt with you. Relatively few are going to be ultra successful. Ultra successful. I mean, in a situation where you have the ability to perform to net a half a million dollars a year. You know what kind of price that's going to extract out of you personally? If you expect, and probably most of you think, if I can just get, if I can just get this degree, if I can just get out of that wretched life college, if I can just do this, they've taken my money, they did this, I'm going to be a $500,000 a year net. And it, at one time in our chiropractic history, and in most professions today, we, don't, I, we never talk about the starvation period. Pre-DE, everyone talked about a four to six year starvation period where you hardly made an income, where you had to have your wife or your family or you had to work two jobs to get yourself established to where you could pay the bills, pay the equipment note, pay the rent, pay the utilities. Five years of starvation after practice. Yet many of you in this room, men and, men and woman, wife, would graduate having a $150,000 debt. And half of it is coming due if you have the heel loan. Half of your debt is going to be due a month, three months, four months, after practice, after you get out and get into this practice. And then, many of you are going to want to continue your education in the postgraduate work or diplomate statuses, that sort of thing. On commencement day, it says you're commencing your career. So I don't encourage. Upon graduation, we seek other avenues to be more educated. I think that we ought to be preparing under today's setup with this loan. The heel loan's interest is moving now. The other loans are not moving now. It's not moving. When you graduate, that heel loan is it's moving right now, the interest in it. So the, 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 the critical thing is to understand the esoterics of a successful person because real soon, after you finish the base, the uh, basic science examinations, the state national boards and the state boards, that's when your total involvement, you've got to find out if you're in the center. Can you emit? Can you project? Can you keep your concentration? Not on books, not on more academics, not on the academia that you're accustomed to all of your life, 
There's a different thought process of these people who are ultra successful. They're thinking about serving the people in a warm, friendly, dedicated, responsible way. Not academics, not more science, not more chemistry, not more physiology, not more orthopathy, not more anatomy, not more insurance slings. You need to develop the love and the feeling that makes these big people successful. It's a different vernacular. It's a different beat. That's what you need to be preparing for on commencement day. You have this diploma. It's unhealthy for a server to spend his, his or her entire day studying for a diplomat program, studying for additional services. You're supposed to be thinking, preparing, visualizing, verbalizing, practicing, outreaching, networking people to get them to come in. Now, there's just a few little simple rules, but it, the first one is total involvement. I know you're partially involved in the academics, but upon graduation, you don't have any planned agenda, agenda in the future. You go to your office if you're lucky. And I don't recommend a lot of, of, of us going out and becoming associates. You think that's great, that you're going to go out. When you graduate from this clinic up here, you should be participating in the lectures. You should be participating in recruiting these people. You don't need another six months of internship out in the field. You don't need to associate with anybody else. You've already done your internship. You've done it at Life College, the hands-on technique, and make it work. The reason we don't do a lot of other things, the only thing that you've got that the physical therapist and the physicist and the orthopods don't have is the adjustment. One thing we can be thankful of, the great respect that Life College students and graduates have throughout the entire chiropractic community you're fundamentally based, you understand the adjustments, you understand the diagnostic procedures of how to identify certain type subluxations. If you know how to do that, how to correct it, plan right now where, where you would have an opportunity. It doesn't specific say I'm going to be in Atlanta or Detroit or New York or L.A. or Frisco. Just know in your own mind the verbalizations of a successful doctor. I'm going to tell you a little something. I was a tech graduate. I still am a tech graduate, I might, might add. I wasn't a brilliant student. It just so happened that, that uh, I, I, it's difficult for me as a 167-pound defensive end to not think about the game. You know what I'm saying? I had to think about it, talk about it, worry about it, plan about it, every second of the day. Only thing I had going was agility, a leaping ability of 37, 38 inches, 9, 9 in the 100, 4, 4 in the 40, nothing else. How am I going to go up against 190, 220-pound uh, running backs? you got to plan. you got to think. When the interference comes out out of a single wing situation, two guards pulling, a fullback coming at the end, the tailback coming at the end, quarterbacks coming at the end, what are you going to do with a 165 pound? Hit the first 200 pounder, knock him backwards? Hell, I might not have had but one game if I did it that way. You've got to think about it and plan about it, your future now. And don't make your future the academics. The clinical sciences, it's great to pass. It's great to have the knowledge. It's great to have the language. Plan on what you say to the people. How do you express this love for chiropractic? Greatest thing you can do. Greatest thing you can do towards your successful future, your continuation of chiropractic, your ability to hold on through tough times, the ability to persuade people, Ability to be able to sell people. If, if you have love first for chiropractic, if you have love for it, I'll, I'll 
talking about my tech experience here. Well, if you're a 2.5 or 2.7, I forgot what it was, probably closer to 2.2, you go to Palmer College, you're going to do better. I'm going to make an honor roll. I think that's where the action is. Well, I got a 3.8, 3.9, border this, but I'm confused and I'm frustrated like you are probably. You know all of this basic science. You know the clinical sciences. You know the health-related subjects. But do you have confidence? Do you know that one thing that you're able to do over here? Or are you secretly in the back of your mind, when I get out of here, I'll have me an ultrasound and a dial pulse and a medical sonolator and I'll do massage, I'll do rollers, I'll do uh, extremity adjustments, I'll do uh, network chiropractic, I'll lay on the hands, I'll give them some diets, I'll sell some nutrition. My God, look at all the products you can sell. What did you learn? You learn that if you made the adjustment, the patient heals. That's your product. That's how you learn. You don't keep neglecting it. You learn how to love it and have an encounter with it where you can express that love. Then you, and fundamentally, my position is I did 18 months at the Palmer School. Nothing did I know about chiropractic. I'm making a career out of it. I'm going to be a chiropractor, but I don't have any feeling. I had no knowledge from anatomy, physiology, orthopathy, the health-related sciences. All of the sciences gave me nothing. I made a career change. My wife and I both are in the school. We feel nothing. So how do I know you? You feel nothing, probably. You don't know that this key's fall. You, you theoretically say, well, that fool's going to drop these keys again. It's paganistic. I'm giving you the essence of the Thai Cobb of chiropractic. You know what Thai Cobb was famous for besides alcoholism? Ty Cobb was one of these individuals when he faced a pitcher, an opponent, the pitcher who was just as concerned and dedicated as him. When he faced that pitcher, he felt master, had the concentration, had the ability, had the talent. He paid the price to maintain that feeling when he walked up to the plate in critical situations. The greatest hitter of all times felt master of every situation. No negatives. He believed he could hit. Relative to my understanding of chiropractic, I'm an A student. Coming from, and I'll tell you, being a 2-5 at Georgia Tech is like a 3-5 a at the university up here. Maybe even like a 3-8. Maybe a, a double A, a 4-0. I got a lot of respect for tech education. You follow what I mean? I didn't know anything about chiropractic. I had all the words, all the verbalization. I couldn't even explain it properly with feeling. When I explained it, it was hollow and empty. Like when you explain it, it's hollow and it's empty. You feel like you need something else. One of the keys is when you explain it, when you verbalize it, it's got to coincide with this. When you verbalize it, is this what you're saying? Are you saying that what you're going to do with these people is going to precipitate and elicit a healing? Are you in doubt? Are you trying to find out the end of the terminal, the tissue cell, the differential diagnosis? Do you need that? Do you expect that? Do you seek that? Do you wish that your education would involve that where you could be absolutely and totally confident? Then would you be better? The prodromal symptoms of cancer begins in 10 years old or 11 years old and then manifests when they're 40, 45, 50. Do you want to take these cases in the prodromal stages of cancer and recognize it through the laboratory experience? Is that what, where your mind is? Over here, we do one internship, one serve. You're learning in this clinic to locate, to diagnose people that have one entity. 
Not a lot of entities. And I know sometimes you get confused because every now and then a patient will come in over there that's really sick. I got a letter last week, John, from a, a student here. The patient comes in. He's a student here. Maybe you're in this audience. You got some kind of asthmatic attack. You need an adjustment. You come to the clinic. You're really desperate for an adjustment. An adjustment. An adjustment. An adjustment. What does the clinic do? The clinic puts you under emergency status, sends you out to the hospital. Our clinic? Are you going to do that when the practice comes in? Every person with problems in the chest, in the kidney, in the bowels, in the eyes, in the throat, in all the other organs? Are you going to do as we demonstrated last week in the clinic? A serious case? We didn't adjust them. Is that the formulation you have? Are you preparing for a wide range of patients? Are you preparing for a health-orientated, preventative-type chiropractic that puts you here, that put me here, that challenges the medical hierarchy? Do you have the vision that if we prevail, if we succeed in convincing the public, is the vision of your service such that we won't need a half or 50% of the drugs? Is your vision, is, that, is it that strong? Are you into treatment chiropractic, musculoskeletal pain, elbow pain, knee pain, leg pain, back pain, headaches, neck aches? Are you into musculoskeletal treatment? Are you formulating your ideas on health, total health of a person? Not total recovery, total health. That's bigger than musculoskeletal pain. Has to do with a new concept. Has to do with a new idea that if we prevail, we win. The medical profession will have fallen with a failed theory. And we're not speaking about nutrition. A lot of you are into nutrition here thinking that you're going to take a course in how to treat diseases with nutrition. You think you're into a nutrition program where you analyze the hair, do a hair diagnosis, a skin diagnosis, a fingernail diagnosis. For what reason? To prescribe certain amounts, proportions of minerals and supplements or homeopathic remedies. Is that what you think this nutrition program here is for? Is that what we're all about? Are you into natural healing where you're going to use hot packs, steam baths, ultrasound, diapulse, nutrition, medcasonolators, mm, colonic irrigations? Is that where you think your, your, your role in chiropractic is? Is that what it, it's about? Of course, there are other measures that will make you healthier, like eating properly, well-balanced diets, like meditation, relaxation exercises, good old-fashioned exercise, maybe even a steam bath occasionally, good nutritional supplementation. And on supplementation, if you go and look at the content on a bottle of box of uh, multi-purpose vitamins. One pill satisfies the nutritional needs of a hundred people. Yet chiropractors will do fingernail, skin, hair diagnosis to prescribe for the treatment. All of which is foreign to what we're thinking about. Foreign. We say this. We say that the brain sends out a message from a particular tissue cell in the brain. We say it has to flow from the brain to the tissue cell uninterrupted. We say there's a stressor at the periphery in any cell, any system, any organ of the body. We say that that stressor presents. The organ sends a demand back. We say if it gets back to the brain properly, the message says, more power, more energy, more strength, more nutrition, more healing, more capacity. Back to the periphery. 
Suppose that the brain is interfered with. It can't function. That's the chiropractic theory. No one else embraces that theory. Even the Graves Anatomy book says function is controlled and regulated by the master system, the nervous system. That's where we stand. Now all of the food, the supplementation, the exercises, the detoxifications, all of the other approaches are insignificant to this. We say the subluxation. When our forefather said subluxation, every other professional, barring none, denied that the subluxation would exist. Denied it in the anatomy books, physiology text, neurology text, and still denied. That tickles me. Bunch of learned ignoramuses. Refusing to listen because you are chiropractors. I've got an article in my take home equipment. Last night, John, the guy talks about. Some have begun to recognize that chiropractic may be effective in some forms of non-disease, non-neurological induced back pain. Great. Very significant for the RAND study. Great to put the chiropractors to have some problems with no neurology involved. If they take the neurology out, if they put you in a circumstance, in a situation when you don't know where and what you belong and what you emphasize and what you're about, if you don't be for something, a lot of times you fall for anything, like calling an adjustment a manipulation. Quit doing that. We know it's a manipulative procedure. Don't let the physiatrists and the physical therapists and the orthopedics and the masseurs and these Muscle testers out here in California, these manual, uh, what's, it, what's the name of them? <laughs> yeah, motion palpators. You go off and take some motion palpation stuff. That's another thing. Quit taking these other seminars. My God, you're in Mecca. This is where it is. It's not in some weekend seminar in New Jersey, or Arizona, or even down here. Not even our seminar. Go to your classroom. Go to these department heads. Go to your division chairman. Get together and talk chiropractic. Don't go take extra courses, extra. Every time a new technique comes along, you drop everything that you've learned and you start following this Pied Piper. You're just walking right off the bridge. You don't know anything. You're just doing it. You're just into it. Learn what you are taught. Pay particular attention to the neck. It's hard as hell to sell. You know what I mean? If you've got the answer to something, and I can tell you that 95%, 95% of your problems that you will be presented with in your practice, you can manage with an upper cervical adjustment. The problem is they get well too fast. Can you imagine a chiropractic, helpful approach that the patients respond to rapidly. My God, if you was a medical doctor and you had this presentation that all your patients got well quicker, back on the job faster, and at less cost, they would have thousands of people lined up. Yet we have that, and we ignore it, basically. The cervical spine the technique you use over here, the technique you're taught over here, and on that subject beginning the first of the year. We even have chiropractors that are so naive. They don't even think that you can draw lines on flat base plate pictures in any area of the spine. They don't think that that has importance. This mercy document forbids payment for x-rays to do that. I didn't quite hear that. What did he say? 
Yeah, boy, I tell you, ICA just spent a, we've been working on it for a year. We are going to have a better document. It's going to approach what chiropractors do in their offices. You follow what I mean? Not a bunch of eggheads, a bunch of politicians, a bunch of academicians that have got silk toast, uh, silk stocking politicians. We're talking about how it actually works, how it really is in the field, how it really is in the practice. So my point to you, don't take a lot of techniques while you're in school. Some of our kids in undergraduate work are taking techniques off campus, confused. The gurus of the chiropractic world, as far as I'm concerned, are in the, on the Life College staff. You may not agree with that. You may think your guru is somewhere else, some other technique guru. And it may be that that technique guru takes more time and takes more consideration because he's selling you. I wish I could cure that where our faculty, oh, you felt a close encounter, a sharp embrace, a cordial relationship with the faculty where they would teach you and nurture you. When you graduated, you would be so confident so confident that you wouldn't take another technique. I'll give you an example. I don't know how to do diversified technique. You think that's pretty stupid, right? I never took a course in anything besides upper cervical work. I have a trained PISA form. When I even think about making an adjustment, it turns red turns pink. Now, I know that a lot of you guys, when y'all start thinking about certain things, other parts of your anatomy turns pink. <laughs> I am serious. I don't know any other technique. I wish I did. There's a block in me that says you already know what to do. It's not how many techniques you know. It's what the confidence you have in the ones that you do have. It's going to get to the basic point of my talk this morning. <laughs> Beginning the first of the year, you're going to have to have a card to get adjusted. You're going to have to have the x-rays to be adjusted. Your card's going to have to present the listing. I can tell you this. You don't have a left listing today and a right listing tomorrow and the next day the fifth cervical and the next day the fifth lumbar. It's Solid. My listing hasn't changed in 50 years. Maybe a little bit that it took enough to somebody give me a double transverse contact up and tying the back. About as much confidence as a goat could walk up my spine. Just a little double transverse, nothing specific. Listings don't change, so to make chiropractic more palatable, more scientific, more helpful, you come in and say, I need an adjustment. Where is your listing card? Where is your x-rays? Where is your readings? And you talk about, I don't use readings. You mean you don't use radar when traveling in space? Oh, no, I wouldn't think of it. Hell, you couldn't even get up to the first stratosphere without any radar. And a chiropractor should be ashamed and humiliated if, if he told some scientist, oh, we don't use instrumentation. We use motion palpation. I can tell you now, 99% of the cervical pictures that you would have made here won't change 30 years from now. I'll tell you an example I had. I was in Dallas, Texas 35 years ago. I developed a headache. A good friend of mine is an upper cervical specific. I mean, if B.J. said go out 100 yards and jump in the fire pit, he would go out 100 yards and jump in the fire pit. Really a dedicated person to chiropractic. He x-rays me. He reads me with his encephaloneuromantiplograph. And he decides that my listing is right. I said, Sterling, I've had a left listing for the past 18 years, it's worked very good. He said, but do you ever get permanent relief? I said, no. He said, the reason for it is your listing is right. I said, Sterling, I've got a left listing. Everybody I've ever talked to before 
has told me it was left. I've actually had myself x-ray. It's not very much. It's the left atlas and right axis, right third cervical. You know, I haven't had my third cervical adjusted except for the last 16 years. Nothing but atlas, axis. I did have a third. Helped me a lot. Had headaches, headaches, headaches. All of my life, every day, the third was moved to seat to axis. The axis rides on the third. This guy in Texas out here, a good friend of mine, says, said it's right. I said, well, maybe that's the reason I hadn't been holding my adjustment. I said, do it. Up a cervical. Well, he does it. Bang. Hits me with a toggle. Right atlas. In about five minutes, I felt like a 25 or 30 pound goat had lay on my chest. Maybe you don't understand that. I felt like something was creeping up on me and just lay down on it. And about 30 minutes later, which was his procedure, I was in the resting area. I felt like there was a horse laying on my chest. I didn't have any pain. I had difficult breathing. It felt like it was squeezed up. I told him, I said, I got a little bit of pain and sensation. Checked my instrument reading. It was fair. By fair, meaning it had a one or two points changed. Can you imagine going by instruments? Or can you imagine flying blind to Nashville, Tennessee, and you, you can't see anything but thick clouds this far in front of you? And what do you have to look at? The instruments. You might even think that you're upside down, but you're right side up. If it wasn't for the instruments. That's what this man did with me. He believed in the instruments. He said, you've had a little change. I said, Sterling, man, I feel like I've been rolled on. I feel like it's a, it's a pony, a horse or something, and I got a little tight tension. I said, I got to fly out of here at 2 o'clock. I can't get on that plane. I said, cancel my plane. Oh, come on, Sid, I'll take you to the airport. I said, man, I'm too scared to get on that airplane. I feel like I'm going to die. I said, you got any pain? I said, no, I don't have any pain. I just feel like they're squeezing me up inside. I go to the airport. I can't get on the plane. Two days later, I catch a train come into Atlanta. Forty-five days later, I'm still laying in the bed up, up yonder in Powder Spring. I tell Nelly every day, I said, man, I might die. Don't get too far away. I said, I can't take you with me if I die, but I don't want to be far. I'm afraid. Don't want you to leave. I feel like this depressing sensation in my chest. Your legs are checking good. We're doing the neuro kilometer work. I, the guy keeps calling me every day. And he talked like this. He says, that Sid, that's the way he talked. And Nell said, hey, Sid today. She said, he, he's terrible, Sterling. He said, well, what the hell's wrong with him? He said, I'll give him a good adjustment. She said, well, it's that chest. He keeps talking about it. He, he, something slept, it was laying on his chest. Well, call me in a couple of days. So he does this for 30 days, and I'm hanging in there. I say, well, hell, maybe this is retracing. You know, hell, I'm in the bed. I can't even work. Can't even drive a car. Can't do anything. Nell drives the car after this for five years. I don't drive the car. Nearly every day, every day I have a sinking spell, and I start running out of the clinic because I don't want to die in the clinic. Nell's running the bed. She's raising the kids. You follow what I'm saying? I can't work. This is after I get the, get the thing. Finally, my friend calls me and says, Sid, but she said, tell Sid, and I want to apologize to him. She said, what the hell's wrong, Sterling? Tell him that he was right. She said, his listed is left. I had the damn x-rays in the view box wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> I recommend to you that you go in there and put him on that table and you adjust his atlas as hard as you can from the left side and then call me back and tell me what happened. Well, Nell takes me in there and puts the double whammy to me on this atlas. I'm telling you, I felt like a big load. I could breathe. I felt like a sweet breath. I had optimism. I had my future. I had everything. I'm telling you, your listings don't change. Do you even know your listing? 
Whether it's some motion palpator will say it's your third today, your fifth today, your second lumbar, your third lumbar, your axis, your atlas. And they all transit and they change. Don't believe it. They don't do it. And I say everybody in this college ought to have a listing, a card with the x-ray listing on it. And quit adjusting in the halls on the floor, sitting in the chair, <coughs> whatever the motion palpation said. Pull out your cards. Here's my listing. I don't want to do it unless I'm in pattern. Unless it says I'm upside down when I should be right side up. Your listing should be there. Your x-ray should be there. And you shouldn't get adjusted on the other side. And you should know that. And your patients should know that. That's what made this profession. This motion palpation, rubby tub tub, three men in a jug type chiropractic is nothing. It's specific. Analyzation of the spine, the subluxation, and then specifically correcting it. And if it don't work, take some more x-rays. You know how I know this? Because I never see anybody looking at the x-rays out in the yard. If you were really involved in the x-rays and you were involved in the toggle, you'd be toggling all the time like this, like I do. You ever go around the hall doing this? No. No, you don't. I do it all the time. I get a certain amount of exhilaration out of it. You should be toggling. You should be looking at the cards. The patient says, how about adjusting me? Where's your card? You don't have a listing? You can't be adjusted if I don't know what to do. I might paralyze you. I had a patient come in to tell me one time. She came in on Tuesday. She'd been a good patient for a long time. Came in on a Tuesday and I adjusted her. She didn't show up Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Three weeks later, I see her in the grocery. Miss Stabler, how you been doing? Well, pretty good. How's your headache? Oh, I don't have a headache anymore. I said, well, how come you hadn't been back to the clinic? Last time I've been up there, I had a kidney problem. I rather had a headache than this kidney problem. I burned on urination. I said, come back. She said, oh, hell, I ain't coming back. I said, no telling what you'd give me. You ever had that happen? You know you can adjust a patient and the left arm will hurt and then the right arm will start hurting or the liver will hurt or the bowels will hurt. And you think about it and you extrapolate that out with all the amount of adjustments we're doing over here. You may be doing it wrong, maybe giving yourself all these adjustments. All you rubbernecks are getting an adjustment today, an adjustment tomorrow, an adjustment the next day. All, and no wonder your innate don't know what to do with your spine. No wonder you've got symptoms. No wonder you don't have any faith. Build it on something. It's called principles. Find out where the subluxation is. Fortify. Now, my original proposition. Time. My original proposition. Got four minutes. My original proposition. And don't start leaving about three minutes till come on. Be hurt. Listen, I studied, and I studied, and I studied, and I had a 4.0 average, but I didn't know anything about chiropractic. I didn't know it. And I'm speaking about the knowledge that will carry you through during the tough time, when you know that you know that you know that you know. Now, I don't expect you to get it in the academics, because it's not in there. It's necessary that you have the academics. It's good preparatory work. I'll tell you a little thing that had happened to me at a workplace. As I mentioned, I didn't know anything. And I was desperately searching for this feeling, this knowledge. When I graduated from Georgia Tech, I was as confused as you are right now. I had a head full of nonsense, books, economics. I did two quarters and a master's degree on labor. And what, I'm not into labor relationships, that type of thing. And I'm scared to death playing football anyhow. I'm not of the enemy. I'm scared to lose my place. You know, a good athlete don't want to make a mistake, not because the mistake's bad, because they'll send somebody in to take your place. That hurts and that's embarrassing. You follow? I had the feeling for academics. I had the feeling for, for football, for uh, excellence. One day I was sitting on the workbench, and in my mind's eye, a little lighted gingerbread person appeared. 
And I'd been trying to figure this thing out. What is it about chiropractic? I knew anatomy, physiology, neurology, orthopathy. I knew everything. It never occurred to me that what we were talking about was the blockage of the energy. And so in a, when I wanted this thing so badly to, to know, I'm saying you need to want to know badly. You need to really want to know about the essence of chiropractic. It's the most critical part. But N.A. gave me this vision of a lighted gingerbread person. You probably say, oh, God, how crude that can be. My mother made gingerbread people. They used to say gingerbread boys. I've changed it, gingerbread persons. You follow? And all of a sudden, this gingerbread person was lit, brightly lit with blue light. And a little arrow came along and hit him in the neck, hit it in the neck. And it went damp. God, I jumped up off of that bitch. I understood chiropractic for the first time. I had an actual realization of what we were about. We removed the interferences that prevented the body from appearing lightly, light, living fully. Man, I went over to this first guy at the workbench. I said, I got it. And in our day, they were talking about, I got the big idea. We still hear a lot of people talk about the big idea. The big idea was this. I said, I want to tell you what a great thing happened. I understand chiropractic, and I feel it, and I can sell it. And this is where I'm based. He said, well, what about syphilis? I said, well, uh, what about it? He said, well, can you cure syphilis? I said, well... I guess so. I went to the next guy and said, I hear you got the big idea. That was a great revelation. Like, I'm saved or I'm born again. I had the chiropractic idea, the big idea. And the next guy said, what about gonorrhea? God, by the time he asked me that, I was out of it. I no longer believed. Two and a half years later, I started believing again. Two and a half years after I had the feeling that I could do it, after I had the feeling of Ty Cobb that I could conquer any situation, when I had the feeling that I was on the right idea and the right principle and had the love for it and was motivated, two and a half years before I got it back. Now, I protect that. If you ever get it, if you ever understand it from that perspective, you still must learn, you still must pass, you still must pass the national board. You've got to pass the state board. You've got to fill out the form. But you can't lose the love. It's like a marriage. The love has got to come first. It will carry you through. Protect the love. Protect the relationship. Don't let anything else interfere with it. Don't let it involve it. Don't let these techniques change it. Don't let the basic sciences, the political aspects, seek the love. B.J. said, you never know how far reaching something you may think, say, or do may affect the lives of millions tomorrow. Get the big idea. Love it. Get in the center. Stay there. You can conquer the entire globe. It'll sweep across this world once enough. Understand it. Now, your enemies are many and well-armed. They've got new tactics, new strategies. They don't love you. The HMOs are going to try to eliminate you. The AMA is going to try a new attack. The government is going to put everybody under the private sector in some preferred provider or some HMO. Many of you will be left out of that with no insurance. You're going to have to adapt. Can you imagine them having a priceless jewel that if I turn these keys loose, they fall and it works. If I adjust sick people, they get well of everything. Can you imagine that? Of everything. Give me a high pizza form if you know how to make one. Not a something a little weak. Come on. Hop a positive form. Not some little cocked up hand like you're waving at somebody. Get a positive form. 
A high pie. Now give your neighbor a high pie. A high pie. When I see you on the street, give me a high pie. And I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Give me a pie, Zephon. Ah, thank you.